Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics and you are looking at Midnight Silhouette. If you're watching this, you are one of the lucky people that were very good about getting your kit. Extremely popular, um, sold out. Obviously one of those types of quilts, that's a showstopper. This is one that you're going to want to bring out and display every fall and keep forever. It's just amazing. Midnight Silhouette by Blackbird Designs. This pattern came out, I have this in my sewing room. I think this thing came out 10 years ago. Maybe it just, maybe that's just like time lapse. <laughs> I don't know how that went that fast. And I have been waiting to make this pattern. I've been looking for the right fabrics for this for so long. And when these combinations of fabrics came out kind of all at the same time, different manufacturers, I'm like, it's now. <laughs> and so you're looking at this amazing quilt and I wanted to have these extra videos so that, um, you know, if you did jump in and grab that, but maybe you're not uh, sure how to make a block like this, I wanna take you through that journey. There's three parts to this video. Number one, let's just break down the quilt. There's really two parts of it. Precise piecing and applique, that's it. There's also one other thing though, and that's these vines. And I'm gonna, that's gonna be a video section all by itself. So again, one video, first part's gonna be how to make our start block. Our second part is these vines, these bias vines. Um, those are not laser cut, they're going to be made. I'm gonna give you two different techniques. You can choose your favorite or do a hybrid of both. I did a, probably a hybrid of both when I was building the vines for this one. And then I definitely want to talk to you about the applique, obviously extensive applique, especially in the center. We had to do something unique here with the moon because it was so huge. And I'm going to talk you through that as well. So we'll break it up in three sections and we're going to kick it off right now with our star block. A really fun technique to make basically the block as you can see it right here and I'll bring it just right in front of me. Let's just study this. We have a center square. And we certainly could use a four and a half inch ruler if you want to just put that down and cut around the fabric or just cut your four and a half inch square. And out here we're cutting some two and a half inch squares. You know, we've got a small two and a half. Again, if you just want to be able to cut around a ruler, that's great. But these flying geese units, that's the part that I want to talk to you about. When you get your kit, the pattern of course is going to have its instructions and its Diagrams inside are reverse for fusible applique. You've already got all of your uh, applique shapes laser cut for you. So that diagram is not going to be helpful to you because it's reversed and they're already cut for you. So we have included a supplement. You are, this isn't just a photo. Very important instructions are included inside that are talking about the specific fabrics that we've put in your kit that are obviously different than the ones she used when she created this quilt now a decade plus ago. We're also giving you instructions on how to make these flying geese units. I'm gonna go over that with you as well. And then a little bit later on, we'll talk about our layout diagram that we've put together for you so that you have a beautiful sight picture to be able to create that all important block. That's really the showcase, of course, of this quilt. So getting back to flying geese techniques, uh, we are taking a really fun approach and we're going to be using a specialty ruler not required. I want to throw that out there by all means, but it's a great option. That's the Ultimate Flying Geese from Creative Grid. I'll talk you through that. We're making two by four inch finished flying geese units. So whenever we're doing uh, this technique to make four flying geese units all at the same time, you start off with one larger square of whatever this larger kind of delta is, this point, and four of the smaller squares. Obviously those measurements are in your pattern. We're drawing a line from corner to corner and sewing on either side of that line. So we're gonna do that right now. I'm just gonna move those pins out of my way. And notice that we have this trimmed. Some people like to trim that in the middle. So basically this was laid just like this. 
And then they just go and trim that intersection. Not required, but some people like to reduce the bulk of that and they just trim that. So that's why that looks like that. Let's go to our machine now. And I've got my Aurafil black in. I normally have that white, but today black is, is more logical. And we'll sew a quarter inch on the other side. Now we'll cut right on that drawn line. With really any, any straight edge, of course, we'll do. I have our light box. I'm excited to talk to you about the applique. I remember seeing this quilt for the first time so long ago and just being absolutely mesmerized <laughs> by the design. Um, so, uh, so amazed by the cleverness of it, the, the, the kind of that folk art classic Halloween that is just absolutely timeless. Love it. So pressing to the outside, both of these. With the other two squares, of course, we drew the line as well. These are going to sit right into that corner and notice that line is going right up through that valley we created. Pin again, and sew a quarter inch away from this drawn line on both of these. I'll just go do that. I'll be right back. Same thing. And actually, I'm going to point out something. I've got some tape on. This is the diagonal seam tape by Cluck Cluck Sew. Notice when, I don't know if you can see this, I'll try to push this up so the side camera can see it. Notice how this line is in line with this black line. It helps me find that quarter inch. I'm certainly looking at the edge of my presser foot, but this is a great place as a guide as well, because as I move, that line should stay right in line with my black. It helps me find that quarter inch away from my drawn line. So we'll cut this apart, did a little bit of chain piecing there, and again, cut on the diagonal. My favorite thing about this approach to making flying geese blocks is the old way, probably the way you might have learned. You had your rectangle, your two squares in the corner, draw the line, sew on the line, and trimming away, throwing away a lot of fabric. I love that this is four flying geese units with minimal waste, maximum speed and accuracy. <laughs> Isn't that what we're all after? That's a great combination of, of positive words. Accurate, precise, fast, <laughs> uh, with minimal waste. I love that. Press to the outside, and that's how we have our four units. Remember though, these are oversized. This gives us the opportunity to trim those up. You can see here, these blocks need to fit into the quilt just like a puzzle. These are just plain blocks right here, but these blocks need to be the exact same size in order to go into the quilt and have everything be nice and square. You'll need to square this up to two and a half by four and a half, and you could certainly grab a ruler. This is a great ruler. This is the four and a half by six and a half. It has the nice, I don't know if you can even see this. I'll try to push this over here. It has that nice point right there, and that dash line is our quarter inch, so that's a great place to start if you want to use a ruler like this. Now, it's a little slow going because you're going to be having to be very careful about squaring up all the way around this. It's not as easy. Let me talk to you about the absolute, well, that's why it's called the ultimate flying geese. It really does an amazing job 
of trimming these things up perfectly with no guesswork. I love that. I, I don't have to guess. What's the best ruler? How do I best approach this ruler? Looking at the Ultimate Flying Geese tool, which is going to produce four flying geese with the same technique we just did. I'm just going to flip a piece of paper over. I'm going to show you how to read this tool. Remember how we said we're looking for two by four inch finished flying geese? So you start on the left side of the ruler and it's saying, all right, I can make flying geese from as small as half inch by one all the way up to four by eight and many sizes in between. So you find what your finished measurement, not your unfinished, finished size is two by four. And that's told us to cut that big black square to five and three quarter and one of those and four of the smaller orange plaid to three and a quarter and do the process we did. The square, the two and a corner, draw the line, sew, put the other two. So we're at this stage. Then trim one and trim two come into play. Back over here on the finished size two by four, eight, two by four, notice we were letter D. That's our designator. We need to remember that when we go to trim one that we're using the lines for letter D. And we'll be able to trim up two sides of our flying geese unit. And then on the opposite side on trim two, we're still going to be letter D. And that's when we'll trim the other two sides. So let's do that step together now. I want you to see this. No guesswork on how this, um, I don't have to try to, manage a ruler that wasn't mission specific for this and like how do I manage that here we're well, starting off with trim one letter D that's us right there right in our little saddle one and two that's your first two trims rotate the whole thing now so that trim two is up uh, notice I'm not touching my fabric I don't have to move that now I'm bringing this down to letter D right in the saddle and look at these lines right here and right there. I have that confirmation, this confirmation and this confirmation. Now I trim here and trim here. And that is an absolute perfect flying geese unit. I, I could not, I, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, I'm not that good to be able to deliver that level of consistency where that block is absolutely not just in the ballpark on the money so when i get ready to sew that to my um, the two sides or to my center it's exactly where it needs to be and obviously we'll take a measurement check and it's right at two and a half by four and a half so that's what this block is going to look like here it's kind of exploded we've made our flying geese units so assembly now is very straightforward as we bring this here, I don't know if you could, probably can't see it, but right there, I can see where those, the thread is here and the thread is here. It's a bullseye so that when I'm sewing this together, I'm definitely sewing on this side. I know my needle needs to pass at that point. So I'm gonna get my iron all the way hot. I do want to show you that if you, if you have this, and you can see it better right here from the side camera, right there, my gaze is certainly going to be here as I approach that area. So let's sew that, and I'm using this here, and I'm gonna add another aid. This is a seam guide, and it provides a nice ridge so that I don't, I, it's a barrier. I'm not going past that, you see that? It's wonderful, so I use the cluck cluck, seam guide as um, seam tape, as well as the seam guide in combination to set me up for success. So we'll give a press and we'll press this to our center for sure, a lot of seams coming together. And look how nice that is, right? That X is very important. If you end up shallow of that and your point is back, seam rip, maybe move your seam guide over, but you want to be able to hit that point. 
So of course, with the rest of that, we're over here, same, of course, sewing on this side, pressing toward the middle, and these two will be sewn here, and you're pressing to the outside. And then of course your top row is pressed to the, sewn to the middle, bottom row is sewn to the middle, and I think by that point we're probably pressing, oh, that's how we did our pressing. I wanted to show you that so you just have a look at that. Center row is pressing toward the middle, bottom row is pressing to the outside. When you sew the top and bottom row to the middle, make sure that you're focusing on those interlocking seams here and pinning here first. Then pin your corners, sew your quarter inch seam, quarter inch seam, and you could press here. I think that's a good way to do the pressing and your block is ready to go. So obviously it's fun to be able to make the different blocks, lots of combinations, wovens, um, screen printed cottons. I love just the texture and the variety of that. This is where we're going to be going next. I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup here. I'm going to give you two options. Um, and I'd love for you to try them both, decide what you like, or maybe it's a combination. We end up doing kind of a combination <laughs> as we were creating our quilt. I'll get cleaned up and I'll be right back for the second part of our Midnight Silhouette video. I'm back with the second part of our video and this is where we focus on how to make that bias vine. How is this stuff made? This is probably the most time consuming uh, part of the quilt. Um, that is a lot of bias that we're making. We tried cutting it on the laser and with the woven fabric and how narrow this ends up being, when we tried to stitch it down, it was shredding. I mean, obviously woven fabric has a looser weave, but it's very narrow. And so we took a traditional approach to making bias and I wanna give you a couple options um, and show you those options and you can decide what way you want to create that. As you can see, the bias has a very tight turn here and it's definitely kind of waving all throughout. For that reason, you're going to want to cut those strips on the angle, on the bias. I've got some fabric here. Normally when we're cutting our fabric, we're cutting right across that width of fabric. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. Normally we're cutting straight across the width. Not so when we're working with uh, something where we wanna have a lot of stretch. Notice, look at this. I can literally make this fabric curve. That's why people cut on the bias. If you're ever doing a scalloped uh, border on a quilt, you're going to always want to be cutting on the bias. So you're cutting your strips. We cut about one inch strips on the diagonal and I'm, I've got some sizing out here and I'm going to show you, I really think it, it helps initially with the step that we're about to do using a bias tape maker from Clover in conjunction with their Clover fusible web. It's a very interesting combination that um, I was able to use and was pretty impressed with the engineering behind this. So. We'll try to get in as close as we can. This is your, our first approach I'm gonna give you to this. Trying to get this started into the um, bias tape maker, I found was one of the most challenging. And once it was going, I'm like, I'm golden. <laughs> just getting it started seemed to be one of my big challenges. But just getting it a little bit wet, adding some sizing and trying to just have the fabric be a little bit more stable as I'm trying to feed that through. So let's look at this. The Clover Bias Tape Maker is meant to do two things. If you see this in, inside here, it's meant to feed the fabric in like this and curl it to the middle. This part up here is meant to accept and we will be loading that in a very narrow strip of fusible webbing. This is just like, just like heat and bond light, very narrow strips of that, where it's smooth on one side, fusible on the other. They've just conveniently cut that for us to fit perfectly inside this bias tape maker. This is the number nine. So as I said, getting it fed in and started is the hardest part. I have found success by trimming the initial portion just to get it in 
And I like to start with kind of maybe creating a little bit of a scoop. So our goal is to feed this in. And sometimes you see it back on the back side. We'll use that applique stiletto. Maybe you've got a pin. You don't want to shred your fabric, but the goal is to get that coming through that funnel right there, kind of out, out this flute. So our first, our first component has been accomplished. Now, with the fusible side down, smooth side up, we'll feed that in here. What a clever uh, invention. And it needs to go down and through. So that feeds through together. So initially, there's a little bit of uh, finessing to get things going. Work on your pressing mat or your wool, your, your uh, ironing board or your wool pressing mat kind of on a diagonal. And your iron is right here, following immediately behind this. So as you pull this through, I'm going to try to pull my head out of the way. I want you to see it. What's happening is the bias tape maker is folding the fabric on top of itself and this fusible is going right on top. That's what's going to hold ultimately the fusible to the back or the bias tape uh, to the background while we stitch it down. So this is a very important step. Notice I don't have this big gap between here and my iron. If you have that, the fabric's going to open up in this process that we've created is not going to work. So you are literally almost touching the tip of that bias tape maker. Notice, you know, because we're cutting bias strips across the diagonal, they're only a select distance. But as you look at the quilt, you can see, and I'll put this down for just a moment, you can see this is a long distance. How do we navigate that? We found it best to work with one strip at a time, get one strip prepared, and you can see there's a certain place where the leaves kind of cover that vine. That's the union. That's the union of one strip to the next. So when you have one strip end and the other begin, just scoot that leaf over to kind of cover that splice. So that's how we chose to marry up those strips so they appear to be seamless. Obviously, they're in, in many sections to create our bias tape. This is your first approach. It's slow, but the results are phenomenal. Okay. I'm just going to cut that. Once we have our background fabric, and I've just got a scrap here, I want to show you how once we remove this, I don't know if you can see it, it's, there's a little bit of a sheen here. I found sometimes I needed a little more glue than that, and I think I have a little bit of glue that was going to be unset with me. If not, I'll grab some. But the point is, look how we can form this. That's what bias does for you. So it's best to kind of figure out, maybe even draw, where do I want this thing to go? And then you're simply forming this. How amazing is that, right? It's down. So when you get ready to use your thread set to stitch that down, this isn't going anywhere. If you have any areas that are just, they didn't get as much of the fusible as you'd like, you could be using the Unique Stitch, which is a great product. Um, Roxanne's glue based it. Just use a very light amount of that. You don't want any oozing out, of course, and then you're able to stitch down. That's your first approach to making this. Some people struggle with using the bias tape maker in combination with this. You could certainly just skip using this product. If you do that, know that what happens as you continue to feed this out, I've done this. Well, I ran out of that at one point. I'm like, okay, I need to keep making bias, but I've run out of this. Just know it's a little bit harder for it to stay together. 
you might need to add more sizing. This does work, but remember now there's no fusible about it at all. You're going to either need to add strips of heat and bond that you've cut to be very narrow and you iron them down afterward, or again, you're using unique stitch or Roxanne's glue based it to glue it down. Pinning, I don't think is a very good option. You just need something to hold it down and out of the way so when you come back later to stitch it down, it's in place. So this does work. But you want to have your iron as hot as possible and you need to go slow. And then if I had my fusible, of course I would keep going. If I have my heat and bond light, we've got packages of it. You're of course cutting very narrow strips and applying it afterward. That works. Same idea. It's just being applied on the second step instead of happening all at the same time. A third approach for you. Doesn't matter how you do this, you just have to do this <laughs> to create your vines for your quilt and it's going to be worth it because this is a legacy quilt. This is going to be one of those quilts you're like, oh man, of all of my quilts, this is one I cherish. So let's say you're like, I hate using pious tape makers. I can appreciate that by the way. They're not easy to use, but once you get the hang of it, they're a great resource. So give it a try and they're super affordable. They come in different sizes. Let's say you don't want to deal with that. You've got your fabric and you want to sew right now. All right, here's your third approach to doing this. I'm going to add a little bit of sizing and I'm just going to let that thing sit there. Notice it kind of curls up. It, it's, it's taking on that right now. Let that just take it on because we are going to not use the assistance at all of a bias tape, a bias tape maker, but instead roll one edge to the middle all the way down. Roll the other on top. The goal being to keep the same uh, diameter here. And now we're coming in with an iron. This method has the least consistency with that diameter. It kind of gets a little narrow, a little bit wider. But if you can be very consistent about how you fold that, you can get that to be fairly even. Now, remember that we really want to have the bias tape down to the background in one way or another, whether that's with a fusible webbing, unique stitch, rock scent, something. You want to have something. So if you take this approach, no problem. You're either going to go back and let's cut ourselves another strip from our heat and bond. Just get that all nice and squared up actually. And the reason I said I did a combination when we were making this is I didn't have a full amount of that on hand. I only had one roll. So I ran out of that. <laughs> so, so then I'm like, okay, I got to make this quilt. So that's where I kind of discovered these different approaches. And I thought, you know what, you guys might appreciate different options depending on what you have at home, what you're comfortable using, and they all get you to the goal. So however you choose to do this, we just know we need to make plenty of bias for our project. And this is same result, right? Different, different approach. We let it cool down, turn it over. Nobody knows how you made it. Nobody cares how you made it. You just did make it. We, does, we, don't we don't matter about the approach. You can see how consistent this beautiful diameter is the same. That's the benefit of working with a bias tape maker. It controls that for you. You don't have to worry about that. If you take this approach, it's a little bit more on you. But still, as we iron it down, 
Oh, can't iron on my cutting mat. Now can I? We still have the beautiful, even though we added a ton of sizing to this, we still have the ability of doing a nice, beautiful arch and we're ready to go and stitch it down, right? So you've got three approaches. Pick your favorite. If you are gonna do the bias tape maker, be sure to pick up the Clover Fusible Web. I, we didn't start with a full roll. One roll will probably, uh, one full roll will probably do the project. But this is a great product to have. You might wanna grab another one just in case. Um, but you know that you have a backup plan if you, if you um, run out of that. All right, again, I'm going to clean up the table. We need to talk about the applique. You can imagine, oh my gosh, Cutting all these leaves, cutting the center block, uh, if you were tracing that and cutting that by hand, you'd be doing this for days. So this is the beautiful part about why you bought this kit. All of that applique is pre-fused laser cut for you. Um, we're going to be just touching on some of the elements of that. I've done a lot of videos about how to use the light box in combination with a layout diagram and the applique fusing mat to pre-assemble that. I'll touch on that briefly, but I really wanna talk about this moon. It's actually in two pieces, but I'll talk to you more about that on the third section after I get everything cleaned up. I'll be right back. So we're at part three of Midnight Silhouette. I went and got some elements for you, I'll tell you. Um, obviously, without the applique, I mean, this would still be a spectacular quilt, but not without this amazing applique. I want to roll over to the back side of what you're getting inside your kit. And this is helping you understand how we're going to break this down into a manageable uh, way to create this. Obviously, we went through our patchwork blocks on um, sections one, four, and five. But notice the other sections all have applique. You definitely don't wanna assemble your whole quilt and then decide to add applique into those borders. Far easier to get your borders cut. You might consider oversizing those, putting that applique down and stitching down, obviously on all four borders before adding them in. So much easier to manage. I've done this where I have everything together and then I'm trying to do applique and stitch that down on my machine. And obviously just the distance from the needle to the machine. I was just a mess, frustrating experience. So this is a way to uh, do this in section so that it's more enjoyable, more manageable. But we're gonna talk specifically more about that very center section too, which is of course, what caught your attention on this project in the very first place. Massive uh, section of the quilt. As I mentioned before, the original Midnight Silhouette by Blackbird Designs contains diagrams that are reversed for fusible applique, but there is no layout diagram. We've created that for you. It's eight large pieces of paper. I'm just gonna show you what that looks like right here. Um, an incredible value added um, into your kit that will be shipping to you. So you'll see these bullseye. Be sure to line those up well. That is going to have the perfect registration. Let me just move this off right now. This is the Wafer 3, the biggest light box that Wafer makes, at least at this time. I'm gonna use that uh, as an aid to get everything lined up. That might be a little bright for the overhead camera. I'll just turn that down. A great feature of this. This is the wafer three, as I mentioned. They also uh, make the wafer one and two for smaller projects. So when you get these bullseyes lined up, go ahead and tape this here, maybe even tape it on the back side. And you've got eight sections here. Let me show you what that's gonna look like right here. You've got eight different pieces of paper that are gonna make up this entire applique block, that's golden. Otherwise, you would literally be looking at a picture trying to get this registration. Let me show you how we created these diagrams for you so you, that you know uh, what you're looking at and what these numbers mean. The numbers are for you to understand what piece needs to go down first, followed by um, the next piece and so on and so forth. So let me just create this. And obviously it won't fit on my table. That would be 
off my table and off here. <laughs> so it's a little awkward, um, but I'm just trying, kind of showing you the gist of it. So you can see how this is all kind of coming together, forming. I don't have mine all taped together, but the idea being that like piece 61, that piece is the 61st piece that's going down. Let me go and show you what our first pieces are, which are not what you would expect. This piece right here, which is right here, is the first piece that goes down. So you can see we started building some of this, and now in comes some of the house, but then this tucks underneath. This layering is very important that you're honoring these shapes in this orientation, and you're placing them in the number sequence that's recommended so that you get the site picture. You don't want that stem on top of that grass. You want that tucking behind. That's why this numbering is very important. Dashed lines mean one piece lies behind the next. So for example, here on our uh, shutters here, we have um, piece number 22. This piece is here. And that dashed line means that while we can only see this yellow portion here, there's actually a portion that extends beneath that shutter, both on this side and this side. That's what that dash line right here is representing. Piece number 22 would go down and then shutter on the left and shutter on the right. And that's where the Aplifuse mat comes into play. How we recommend that you do this is exactly what I just talked about. Make this shutter and window unit. Make this one, make this one, make this one, make this one. Maybe you make the floor or the ground, excuse me, with the pumpkins and that's the section. This one is, is not easy for me to demonstrate. It's just too big. So I have to kind of talk you through this one um, with specific emphasis on the moon. How we did this and what I want to show you about this specifically the shape of the moon was too big to fit on one piece on our laser. So what you're getting, notice this line right here. That is, you're going to get in your kit two uh, pages of the yellow. These are not identical. You've got lots of your leaves. Of course, you're going to punch these out. Can you imagine tracing all of this and cutting all this out with scissors? I mean, no, <laughs> no thank you. I love having it all just done. So you'll punch all your leaves out. Let me just do that. And I wanna show you what is, is also in here. And that's part of your moon. It has a funny line on it and I'll show you why we created that like that for you. And that's to make your life easier and to hide a seam. Let me get this out of here. I may have said it, um, or maybe I didn't. Don't throw anything away until you put everything down. All of your shapes are ironed down because it's easy to miss a shape. And if you throw it in the trash and the trash goes out, well, there goes that shape. And I think I have everything, but still, I would just put that aside until I'm sure. Now, the only thing I'm going to punch out of this one is the other part of my moon. I do see I have my windows here. I see that right there. And I'll, you know what, now that we talked about that, let me just grab that taller window. I want to show you what I'm talking about with the window. So this, this part here is our window, but you can see when we lay this down, of course, you're not going to lay that down on your, di on your paper. You would have your Aplifuse mat on top of that, and you're seeing through your mat onto this with the light box underneath. That's when that piece would go down and the shutters go on top. That's what I'm talking about. Those dash lines help you understand that's going to lay behind. But let's jump back into this moon block, because that's the one... Normally, we're not having to give you a shape in two pieces. It's normally one piece, not two, but not possible with uh, the moon because of the restrictions that we talked about with just the size of the lasers. 
we use American-made lasers, and we're very proud to say that. So um, they are smaller than other types of lasers that are maybe manufactured elsewhere. And so we do have that um, limitation. I'm just moving this to where a cat needs to be. All right, that line that we talked about, the reason we had to put, and we did make that cut there, is because the cat, except for the very tip right above its ear, and you, can bear, you can't even see this. I can't even see this and I'm standing right next to it. This piece will come here and the next piece will not overlap, but, but adjacent immediately to it, just like that. This is the only shape in your kit that behaves this way. Everything else will have the entire shape as one unit. And historically, just like we talked about, you have this overlapping. The main shape goes down and the other two are overlapping, but never budding right up next to each other. So this is the only one. It's very unique. If you've been doing laser cut a long time, you may have never seen anything like this because we've never had to do anything like this before. So that is going to just butt right up against that. Iron that down. Don't work, do not stitch on this because later our cat, our cat, when we put that shape down, it's gonna go right over top of that seam just like that. So I wanted to point that out. I've done a lot of videos on how to use the uh, light box in conjunction with the Applifuse mat. So if you wanna see that with real fabric going down, really any pint-sized table runner, I'm doing that every single month right now, demonstrating that. But this is, this is the combination, light box, layout diagram, uh, fusing mat. So if we were to just take our, I'll take this out of the way, it's so big, and we were to do our window, and by the way, the Applifuse mat comes in two sizes. You might want to grab the smaller one as well. It's nice working with a smaller mat when you don't really need the big one. So this is how this would work. Light box, layout diagram, Applifuse mat. Shapes are going directly down on top of that. Not sure where I put that window. Right, that piece is going down. And then you can clearly see where the black go down. Once those three shapes are there together, you need to move that and with a medium heat, you're ironing everything together, letting it cool down, peeling that off and doing the next section. Once you have all your sections together, then I, I recommend really kind of laying everything out before you start ironing anything down. It's got to fit, right? It's got to fit. One thing I want to point out to you, and it's the one area where this block is not, like this is the block right here. The tip of this leaf extends into that patchwork. If that bothers you, just tip that leaf to be fully inside because the background is right here. So basically, if you want yours to be exactly like this, you're able to put everything down to the background and stitch it down except for that. You could put that down maybe to this point sew this section together and then put the tip of that down. But it's the only piece that she had now kind of uh, merging into another section of the quilt. So I wanted to mention that as well. This one's next level, right? It's, it's not your cookie cutter, simple applique project, but you can see the results are absolutely worth it. Again, good job getting your spot in this. I really hope due to the popularity that there's another combination coming up where we could offer that again in the future. Right now, I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of the fabrics coming out for 2023. Nothing is really lending itself to the right fabrics for this, but you can be sure I'm looking. I'm constantly looking. Um, subscribe. If you haven't done that, um, be sure to do that. Let a friend know as well. It's hard to find these amazing kits that we put our whole heart into obviously producing next level diagrams, layouts, and pre-cut applique makes it so easy, so approachable. So even if you have a friend that, uh, that's maybe admired your quilts, invite them. Invite them to join the amazing world of quilting. Thanks for letting me show you about Midnight Silhouette, and I'll see you soon on another shabby video. Mm -hmm.